no longer a core asset or core pocket of assets for our business. We still love those assets. We still believe there's upside and value in those assets. However, as a company, we have probably outgrown them and it's time to move on. Our preference as well as that of moving on is to deploy our resources into our, our larger assets, more valuable assets and more material assets and extract as much value from those as we can. Just to touch upon our partnerships briefly, I don't believe that there's any other junior oil company with partners of the quality that we've got in Tullow, BP, Rock Copper, Hibiscus and QA, all of which really is a testament to the quality of our assets, our strategy and, and our team. The company focus is to continue to develop our assets and what well, a number of you have asked me recently about potential new acquisitions and adding to the portfolio, that's really not the core focus for us just now given current market conditions. In saying that our ambitions for the company remain unchanged despite the market. It just means we have plot a slightly different course in the short term. But we don't have to step outside the business to grow it. The significant organic growth to be had in an existing asset base. And again, if you go back to what's been achieved in the first six months of this year, increasing production in Egypt, um, moving, developing the, 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 the other assets we've got in our portfolio, we certainly believe a significant organic growth that we can go and realise from the existing assets without having to step too far outside of the business. I'll pass over to our Chief Operating Officer, John, now, who will walk through our assets in a bit more detail. Um, Egypt is obviously uh, of particular significance and importance given our recent announcements. And John will explain in a little bit more detail what that means to the company, our reserve numbers, and uh, the future uh, work programs. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. And um, so, as like Ryan said, I'll go into these assets in a bit more detail now. Um, we've got the presentation from you starting on slide seven. I'll initially give you a, a summary of the overall portfolio and then dive down into individual assets in, in, in more detail. So starting on slide seven, if we are in we have assets in four countries um, in North Africa and Europe. Uh, we are involved in Egypt, Italy, and the UK. And those assets on the on the left hand side of the slide, they're what we would consider to be low risk assets. And what we mean by that is they're either already on production, as in Egypt, or we see near term activity that will either generate production or cash flow. Um, and the aim of that whole portfolio really is to deliver deliver production and cash flow from that to provide a very strong and robust platform that will underpin the business. So we have a very robust business going forward. And what that also enables us to do is then to be able to take positions in, in selected higher risk or more frontier options where there is really access to much more transformational potential. And that's where Jamaica on the right hand side of this uh, slide comes in. It is a higher risk asset, there are higher rewards that come with that and we believe it provides a balance of portfolio. It's exposing investors to the potential transformation return that we believe to be there. But it is worth emphasizing that although you know, we, we do want exposure to those high risk things, we want to make sure that we are never at any point overly exposed, exposed and we have a really strong uh, production cash flow generative platform to underpin the business. Um, so that's the overview of the portfolio. Um, moving on, I uh, can straight into Egypt initially on slide eight. But before getting into the details of the asset, I think it is just worth giving a brief uh, reminder that you know, we only completed the Egyptian transaction at the end of February. And you know, on any deal that we look at, we are very selective. Um, before we did Egypt, we reviewed a huge number of opportunities. And it was only when we saw value that we moved, you know, that we moved aggressively on it. Uh, and that's very much what we did in Egypt and proved to be a successful approach in Egypt. But what I wanted to say was, you know, what made Egypt stand out compared to all of those other opportunities? And there were, there were three key things really. One was a robust production base. Another was a low cost operating environment, which I think the importance of which has become particularly clear over the last two, three months. And the other piece, which you know, from our experience is quite unusual when you're looking at production assets, we saw significant development and exploration potential in this asset as well. And I think what's been really nice for us to see is since we announced the deal, we've seen the realization of some of that value that we did identify. You, know, you can see in the production of our assets already production has had a very large increase since the beginning of 2019. 
across the year, the start of 2019, the start of 2020, we've had 190% reserves replacement ratio. But what I really hope to get across is from the performing side of this in Egypt is, although it's really nice to see the assets falling so strongly, we believe there's still a lot more value um, to be gone after within that asset, and that's what we are you know, we we hoping to live up um, into the future from it. So getting now into the details of the asset in Egypt itself, on slide 9, um, it's the, the Abu Selling license, it's located in the onshore of Egypt, um, in the western desert area. Uh, the western desert is a, is a prolific hydrocarbon producing basin. Um, the asset itself is operated by QX Energy, and it's got a number of different elements that make up the concession overall. If, if you're on slide 9, you can see that the pinkish, reddish area, that's the exploration area, and then there are seven development concessions as well contained within within the license. And each one of those development concessions contains a producing field, um, and there are 17 wells currently on production across those seven fields. And when you consider that the, uh, the pay that's found in those wells is typically found across multiple uh, different reservoirs, when we mention and talk about robust production base, that's what we really mean, is that you know, we're really mitigating risk of any single reservoir, any single well, or any single field uh, falling over or something happening to it, there'll still be uh, production coming from a significant number of other fields or wells. The other thing on this slide is, you know, we mentioned about the low operating costs as well. You can see that the you know, financial region, there's a lot of activity for access to wells. The drilling costs are low, uh, typically less than $4 million per well, an operating cost per barrel around about six and a half dollars per barrel. So we're talking about some of the, the lowest operating environments, you know, it competes globally um, in terms of a, a low cost environment. And what that translates to ultimately is a very low break even oil price. You know, this, these assets are still cash flow generative uh, well below twenty dollars a quarter. So again, when we're looking at oil prices today, I think that gives us a lot of comfort that you know we we, we are generating cash flow at the moment. Um, but also, if you know, we have seen a lot of volatility for a further falls, we have got protection in that sense. Then moving on to slide 10, uh, getting into a bit more detail on the reserves and the production summary. Um, through 2019 and the first half of 2020, there was an ongoing development drilling campaign, and that has delivered uh, significant additions both to the reserves and to the production. Starting with the reserves um, from the end of 2018, we've seen a 12.5% increase in the reserves, and we take into account that at the same time as uh, that increase happened, there was significant production coming from the assets. That equates to 190% reserves replacement ratio, which is a very healthy, um, healthy number to be talking about. For us, it translates into uh, a two-piece net working interest reserves number of 3 million barrels of oil equivalent. Um, but when we're talking about that, it is worth pointing out that that does include um, the results, the, the oil at ash, and it does include um, the algebra of gas that was brought on stream recently, but it doesn't include uh, the gas at the ash fields where there are plans in place to bring that on stream, and it does not include the recent results from the ES5 well. So although we have seen an uplift, you know, there, there is clearly potential to actually increase those numbers further given some of the recent plans that have been approved and the uh, well results that we've had. When you move across to look at the, the production chart, but since the start of 2019, I think you can see the additions there have been even more dramatic. And the assets performed really, really well throughout 2019. You can see in the red the increase from the, the development drilling on the Al Jarrah field. But the real step change came with the Ashwell. Um, we talked about that previously, but you know, that came on stream at the beginning of January, added 3,000 barrels worth per day. You can see that in the dark green. And it has continued to, to really outperform expectations. Still, uh, still on production at, at 3,000 barrels of oil per day, so performing really, really well from that. And then at the beginning of March and the orange, you can see the uplift as the gas at Al Jarrah was brought on stream, and then just recently, beginning of June, in the light green is the ongoing production testing from the US Army well, that has really given another step change in terms of the levels of production you're seeing from the asset overall. And I was saying, you know, June there, when that came on stream, we're looking at uh, gross levels of over 14,000 BOEs per day, which equates to well over 3,000 BOEs per day net to us in early June. So we found a well, clearly a very good result, and slightly a little, a little bit more details on that. Uh, these well results were released at the beginning of June. The well itself, I mean, it was a development well. It was drilled into an existing field, so I think it's fair to say we very much expected this well to find hydrocarbons. Um, but however, the uh, primary target in the crew, it came in shallow supernosis, meaning that there was a lot 
Moriarty and ARG. Um, and what typically happens with wells on the average other licenses that they will be put, different residents will be put onto production sequentially. The idea being here, the creek will be put on production first, and then after that has depleted, we then go and complete on the other reservoir intervals. And what that means is not only have we got a great resource in the Carita, um, but also, you know, potentially a long life from the well as, you know, further down the road, a number of years further down the road, we can tap into some of those other uh, reservoir intervals that so far have not been, uh, been tapped into. So you're basically a very positive result there. Moving on to slide 12, um, I'd like to talk a bit more about the other side potentially. What we've been talking about so far is clearly shown um, the development drilling campaign that's been going on have, have delivered great results over the last 12 months. Uh, and, you know, we've seen not only significant development potential remaining, and you know, we did have three further wells planned for 2020, which were going to be going into uh, the existing fields, and that they were deferred until oil price recovers. But there is a plan there ready to get after that further development potential at an appropriate time. But the thing that, that, that to me, I think, you know, when we're looking at this and even now, I guess the most excited is the, the exploration potential beyond the existing fields. Um, we have mapped a portfolio of over 35 exploration prospects. Um, you know, these range from, from near field step outs in, in well understood plays to, to under explore plays at varying size or risk with potentially larger volumes. When we talk about risk on this asset, it is worth pointing out that a lot of our exploration targets, the historic success rates have been around about 80%. So, you know, the risk is, it is a relative number. And when you also consider that the low drilling costs, um, you know, the quick turnaround time and the infrastructure that's already there, you don't need to find a lot of oil in these to actually have commercial accumulations um, from, from work that we've done, you know, half, less than half a million barrel of oil will actually end up giving you very good um, returns. Um, I think, you know, looking at Egypt, we, in terms of the exploration, how we're moving that forward, we've been doing a lot of work to high grade our prospects ourselves and internally within the company. We've seen a number of, uh, of interesting uh, near field step outs, uh, Ash West, El Sami West, especially given the recent drilling results. And then we see things that are a bit more, the further step outs of potentially larger structures like uh, Jabaria, uh, maybe Prospect X. We do have a commitment well to drill on the exploration piece um, before, before September 2021. And the next step will be to discuss with partners and agree on a prioritised um, target that is going to be the best initial target to go after for the exploration. So that was the slides on Egypt. And I think you know, there's quite a bit there over the last few slides we've through. And the key message really is, you know, so far today the asset has been performing really, really well. Um, but we still see significant potential remaining and I'm looking to, to make sure that we're in a position to get after that. So moving on to some of the other assets we have in the portfolio, um, on slide 13, looking at the Italy and the Federa Galina license, where we hold a 20% non-operated interest. Um, and basically, Italy here is a story of continuing uh, progress through the permitting process. We uh, are now looking at first gas in the first half of 2021. We recently received uh, technical environmental approval from the Italian Environmental Ministry, and the next milestones we need to go through, the next one is the final EIA approved, and then we need to get some production session construction approvals. And we're working through those, those milestones, and as we go through them, I think, you know, saying first of 2021, there is quite a wide time span included in that. As we go through those milestones, we'll be able to constrain and clarify um, when that first gas will, will be coming on stream. Now, in terms of what we expect when it is on stream, um, you know, these wells will be well sorted very, very well on test, um, nearly 900 POVs per day. Um, and, you know, given the capacity of the facility of success, if we're producing at those rates, um, given the current all the gas price curve, I mean, we would be expecting this to be delivering to us on our pre tax basis of $1.8 million per year. So, you know, it is, there is a lot of value in here when it comes on stream, but as we move on to slide 14, the thing I want to make sure we don't forget about is that there's a lot of upside potential on this license too. I and mean, our focus over the last year or so has clearly been on getting solar on stream and getting production. But we were initially attracted to this license due to a lot of follow-on potential that exists there. There are other known accumulations that are discoveries within the production concession area, but also prospects. E-Solar, potentially twice the size of solar itself. Ricardini, potentially four times the size. So there is material outside on this license. And the really nice thing is, is that they sit within
within the production concession. So the birthing process that we have had to go through from the solar, we will not have to go through that again. If we have success and well on these structures, we'll be able to put them very quickly and take the true facilities that will then be in place for solar. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of follow-on um, potential there, which we, we are keen to have to at an, at an appropriate time. Um, and and uh, once, once we have solar, uh, solar on stream. Moving away from anything to the UK and into the North Sea, now on slide 15. Um, we were really pleased last year to be awarded four blocks in the UK for the first licensing round. We identified a number of prospects within those blocks, um, which you can see on the map on slide 15. Uh, the one that we really uh, high graded was the Zeta prospect. It's, it's low risk, it's relatively shallow, uh, and potentially contains 90 million barrels of oil in place. So, a pretty uh, substantial uh, prospect. The other thing is that it is in an area that's very close to infrastructure and an area where there's a lot of activity going on. You know, we're just a few kilometres from the Piper Field, we're around less than 20 kilometres from the Crown assets that we that we held and successfully divested to our Syria Hibiscus, who are and they're feeding into their development plans for the Marigold Field, which is right next door to Zeta. So a lot going on in the area. We, we have a history of being able to um, complete deals on assets in this area. And right now we're looking to complete technical studies work program on Zeta, um, adding value to it, and then either looking to bring partners in to, um, to accompany us in drilling a uh, well on that structure, or potentially uh, doing something similar to as we did on Crown with it. And in slide 16, still in the UK, we're moving to a very different area, down to the south coast of the UK and the West Basin. Um, we have a number of licenses there, um, mainly on short portfolio, although in Brantford it's already, although these are attractive assets, uh, some recent modeling work on the water cross field, for example, suggested we could get 800 barrels of water a day from a field, from a, from a well there. I think with the completion of the Egyptian transaction, our strategic focus has, has clearly shifted, uh, and these assets, as much as they're attractive, are now a candidate for divestment. And then the final slide in the um, I'm running through the assets, moving on to the Walter Morris license, license in Jamaica. As I mentioned before, it is different to the other assets. It is high risk, high reward. We have a huge acreage position here. It's over 30,000 square kilometers. And the primary target, which is the Calibri prospect, has been de-risked on 3D seismic. And you know, we estimate that it holds well in excess of 200 million barrels. Now, given the size of the acreage, I think it's, it's pretty it's pretty obvious we have a number of other follow-on structures there. We've identified 10 to 15 similar size structures. So the key thing with this is when we're talking about transformational value, it's not just Calibri as a standalone prospect, it's what Calibri opens up in terms of de risking the rest of the basin and getting after further 10, 15 similar size prospects and you know, really start to add up uh, and, and give us that, that other size that we get very excited about. Now, so, um, have been operating the assets. Um, they've done, you know, done a lot of work um, with them while we've been on it. And all that work has really um, helped demonstrate and provide very good evidence that all the elements we want to show that Libra should work are, are actually present in the license. We have an extension from the, first, from the end of January um, to extend the license until the end of July of this year. Uh, and so I've now indicated that they are planning to leave the license at that point. We have initiated discussions with the relevant authorities in Jamaica on, on forward options, and we're really looking at ways that you know we take this forward, get an extension, um, and you know we really want to be in a position that we can continue on the license and actually unlock the value and the potential that we see there. So that's um, that's it on the portfolio. We're going through all different assets individually, and I think just to you know quote a lot. Uh, a few slides and a lot of information, but to really summarize it, what I think we have here in the portfolio right now is a really nice balance and, and a really strong core uh, asset base. In Egypt, we've got great performance, great production, low cost environment, um, and potentially you know, a lot more to come from that. Italy can be on stream next year, uh, I'm not forgetting about the other side that will follow on once we do get on stream. Uh, UK, exciting near field prospects. You know, active area near infrastructure work that we have, uh, you know, have a history of being able to complete deals, and then Jamaica, super wildcat, and you know, fantastic transformational potential, which you know, we're looking to uh, to to stay in uh, and be there for. So I'm going to give you, uh, you know, a brief flavour of uh, the portfolio assets we have, and uh, I'll, I'll now pass on to uh, our chief financial officer, David Quirk. Thanks, John. So I've just got in for.
slide 19, uh, just on the financial strategy of United. Um, at United, we've implemented a, a conservative financial strategy uh, that complements the business strategy and will work for us for the longer term. Uh, this will work for us as we grow. And I think on the right-hand side, we just wanted to show that it's not an aspirational strategy. We've delivered on this strategy, and I'll go through some of the elements of that right now. On the capital structure, it's very important that we get that right and that we don't rely exclusively on, on the equity markets. Uh, when we look at transactions, we look at bankable transactions. And on the delivery side, we have uh, implemented a very innovative structure with BP last year, which funded 50% of the Egypt acquisition um, with, a, with a, a blue chip partner, uh, BP. So I think that and we've also demonstrated that we can raise equity in very challenging markets, such as Q4 last year. Um, on portfolio management, portfolio management can be a, a proxy for generating internal equity. And it's important that not alone are we good at acquiring assets, but that we also divest assets, which we did last year in, in divesting the crown asset in the UK for $5 million. And as John has mentioned, you know, we've tidied the portfolio up and nominated some assets for divestment this year and not progressed our, our option in Benin. So you can expect us to be you know, active portfolio managers. Another area that we'll be very active in is in uh, commodity uh, price risk management. And we're going to be an active hedger. In this industry, there's lots of risk is, is below the ground, so we want to continue to have a, a conservative approach to our financial strategy. And given um, the low oil price environment over the last three or four months, our, our head structure, which was embedded in our in our um, acquisition facility from BP, has really paid off. Um, and this facility, as we've mentioned before, is very good in a low oil price environment, but in a high oil price environment, it gives us full exposure to the upside. So you can continue to see us actively hedge our um, production. In terms of capital allocation, uh, we set some high hurdle rates for our um, capital allocation. Uh, this is both within and outside our portfolio. So certainly the top tier opportunities are progressed. Um, and we, we've demonstrated that uh, throughout the last year um, in terms of prioritizing uh, the Egypt transaction and also Italy and the way that we have decided not to progress with some of the other options and opportunities that we've had. And lastly, just on, on free cash flow, that's the metric like all E&P companies that we measure ourselves rather than on, on profits or, or P&L. I think um, the demonstration of, of this pillar of the strategy really is going after assets in a low operating cost environment, being disciplined about our, our G&A management. And I think in terms of demonstrating further this year, and we've had to react very quickly to protect our, our free cash flow, um, as you'll have seen from our corporate updates um, in, in the middle of this year, where we successfully were able to defer some of the uh, three of the Egyptian wells that were in the capital uh, program for this year. We've also deferred uh, development in, in Egypt, uh, significant g and &E, and then benefited from both the, the fixed gas price in the, um, in the, within the Egypt uh, production and also our, our hedged uh, structure um, certainly has benefited us as well. What we really need to summarize here, we, we've set this strategy for the long term. We're not going to have to reinvent it as we go. You will see it's a conservative strategy, um, but it's paid dividends, dividends for us and protected ourselves and our, our capital uh, over the course of the last couple of years, and we expect it to continue to do so as we go. Um, so that's it on financial strategy. I'll hand back to Brian to cover the, the next uh, slide. Thank you, Brad. Um, in terms of future outlook on, on slide 20, we've a hell of a lot to get after. We start with Egypt. Initially, to bring ES5 on stream and uh, implement the ASH pipeline, there was John's touched upon. There's 35 more targets in Egypt for us to get after. There's 29 million barrels of oil equivalent to chase with an historic 80% chance of success. And what's really interesting about these opportunities or these targets is the quick turnaround to getting them on stream and into production. So over the coming months, we will be working up a list of targets and, and, and exploration targets to prioritise them, as John has said, so that we have a plan uh, to put to our purpose for uh, execution of our drilling programmes maybe towards the end of this year into, into next year. In Italy, UK and Jamaica, um, in Italy, the final environmental impact assessment decree, sorry, is due this year. In addition to that, the final construction approvals will be aiming to get them this year as well, all leading towards forced production 
from Zelda in H1 2021. So a lot happened across Egypt and UK. In addition to that, we've also got our UK business in the foreign West investment. But we've also got the set of visa prospects, which John has discussed, which have potentially 90 million barrels of scope. And we've, we've kicked off our work program to try and create as much value from that license as we possibly can. I think probably the most important point from Slide 20 is the value potential. Our market cap today is probably 25 million US. Our risk now is 70 million, and our own risk right now is 22 million, I'm sorry, 220 million, which is nine times where we are today, which is which indicates that all the upside is still there to play for. And it's, 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 it's there for us to go after and it's there for us to, to materialise. And I go back to, where, to, work to the point I made when, I, when we started this small small call. We've been executing our work program and developing, I'm sorry, and realising that value. And, and we look forward to doing that across the rest of this year and into the 2021. And then finally, just to wrap up on slide 21, you know, this is for life cycle EMP company. We have assets in the production and production assets, we've development assets, we've exploration and appraisal assets. More importantly, our portfolio has a, a well balanced approach to risk management. We've completed our transformation acquisition that we set out to achieve at the beginning of twenty nineteen and we've landed some blue chip counterparts in that transaction with BP and Rockhopper. We've added to an impressive list already the very acute uh, hibiscus and, and, and companies like Tullow. We do feel that we've for well placed for future growth, both organically within the asset base, which we've discussed, but also externally. As of today, we're not formally engaged in any acquisition process, but we are always looking at opportunities. And as we said, if, if something comes along that we feel will have significant value, we then we certainly consider it. And as David has outlined, we have a very prudent and careful financial strategy to support the growth of the company. And that's a long-term strategy. It's not a short-term strategy. We're planning for the long term. And as I mentioned before, despite the, the COVID challenges and the market challenges, um, our plans for the company remain the same. And our strategy to execute the growth plan for the company uh, is in place. Touch upon potential growth value in the asset in terms of monetary perspective, but also, you know, it's worth touching upon the strong track record of the company. Since we listed the company three years ago, we have a proven track record of execution, of ability to raise, raise finance, both on debt and in challenging markets. And we've also, uh, we've also got a track record of history of completing uh, attractive deals where there's significant upside. Um, I think at this stage that probably covers everything in the presentation and, and what we wanted to really share with our shareholders this morning. So I'll pass over to Philip who will have some, some questions. But just before I do, um, we have had quite a number of questions submitted to the company. There's been quite a lot of duplication, so we've tried to edit them down somewhat so that we're not repeating ourselves. And there have been some questions submitted that, that we just can't answer for commercial reasons. Uh, some questions we can't answer because it would be we would be essentially providing information that we can't provide to the market at this stage. It's commercially sensitive. So, but we will endeavour to, to answer as many questions as we possibly can that have been submitted. Philip, do you want to kick off with the first one? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Brian. Uh, okay, so let's start with, with the first question. Uh, why was there no revenue books for Egypt in the financial year 2019 result, given the effect? Effective date of the acquisition was 1st of January 2019. Uh, they will, uh, will give an answer. Yeah, just, just to be clear on that one, we'll be following the accounting rules there, which state that the results of the rock upper uh, Egypt operations will be included just from the date of the completion of the acquisition, which is the 28th of February 2020. And what that means in practice is that all the assets and liabilities will be valued at that date and incorporated on the balance sheets at those values. Everything between the effective dates, so all the operations between the effective dates and the completion will be dealt with through the fair value acquisition accounting uh, under IFRS. And these results will be visible in our 2020 interims, which will be published before the end of September 2020. Okay, so 
so we have another question for you, Dave. Um, how will the acquisition be accounted for in the 2020 interim results? Yeah, so just following on from, from question one, as I said, the, the subsidiary will be consolidated from the end of February 2020, which is a date that we assumed control, which is the important factor. So what you'll see is four months P&L activity in the 2020 interims, and the balance of the results, I guess, which is the focus of the question, from January 2019 to February 2020 will be accounted for in the balance sheet as part of that acquisition accounting. So what you'll see, I think, is an improved balance sheet coming across, reflecting the, the production uh, from the effective date of the transaction. Okay, so moving on to the next question, uh, what is the capital expenditure program for Egypt in 2029? Um, John, we'll, we'll give a chance to ask this question. Thanks. 2021, I think. <laughs> um, so what usually happens is that departments on the license will convene for a technical meeting and workshop around about August, September time. Um, and that is when the work program for 2021 is first proposed by the operator. That is then worked up technically and economically and gives an opportunity for, for partners to actually have some of their own input to that. And then it is agreed um, at a meeting typically in December time. So we, we would expect, we wouldn't actually expect the capital expenditure program for 2021 to be approved and agreed until towards the end of this year. However, I think it, it probably is fair to say that, you know, given the success of the two most recent wells, the Ash 2 and the Osamia 5, and the upside that we still see in the assets and the relatively low drilling costs, um, you know, across the asset, I think, you know, we, we, we are looking forward to reinstating the third uh, development drilling campaign um, in 2021. And also, as we're pointing out, you know, we are, there is uh, an exploration commitment well that has to be drilled before September 2021. I think we've shown already there are, there are a large portfolio of prospects to choose from, and we're really looking forward to agreeing with partners which target will actually be um, what we get after with that exploration well. Um, but yes, yeah, it's too early to make any firm figures on that at this stage. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, Dave, we have another question for you. Uh, what is the current United Cash position? Yeah, uh, thanks for that. We only declare our cash position at the interim and, and full year results. But I think as you'll have seen from our, our April corporate updates, you know, we've acted very quickly to adjust our, our cost base and to defer discretionary work programs. Coupled with that, production has been increasing very significantly, as John has outlined. So from, from a cash perspective, uh, you know, we're very comfortable. We remain confident that we'll not be returning to, you know, to the equity markets. We're fully funded to carry out our, our current work programs. Okay, uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, could you say more on Jamaica and news flow in the next few weeks or months? Uh, Brian, this one is for you. Yeah, um, well, you know, we're in discussions with the Jamaican Ministry at the moment. Uh, the license obviously uh, uh, ends at the end of July. We are in discussions with the Jamaican Ministry at the moment. Uh, I don't want to say too much about it at this stage, but we'll certainly update the market uh, fairly shortly. Uh, another question for you, Brian. Uh, could you comment on share price performance? Yeah, well, you know, as a management team, you know, we're quite frustrated with the share price is and how it's performed. Particularly, we don't feel that Aegis is reflected in, in the current share price. Um, coupled with that, we've seen significant volatility in global markets and in commodity price, which obviously hasn't helped. Um, but I think it's a market fully understands the value generated by the Egyptian assets and the acquisition. I will be confident and I certainly have an expectation that the share price will reflect that uh, in the second half of this year. Um, but I think it's important to point out that the executive team, and certainly myself, uh, our, our key objective is to deliver as much value as we can from our asset base and to manage the business to the best of our ability. And we continue to focus on that, and that has to be our core objective. And once we're doing that right and getting the business decisions right, you would expect to see that reflected in our share price. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, can you provide an update on Selva with an estimated first production date and the net cash to UOG expected from a full year of operations at current gas price? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think probably addressed some of this in the, in the slides already. I mean, we, we've made clear our expectations with respect to first production during the first half of 2021. But as we continue uh, making progress through the permitting process, we, we hope to be able to narrow down the estimate of when actually uh, first gas will be coming on the stream. Um, in terms of the cash, well, I mean, based on, you know, if you look at the, 
the current gas curves that we're looking at and given the uh, test results and capacity of the facilities we will have there, I think we will be expecting annual net revenue of around about $1.8 million on a pre-tax basis once that um, once it's producing in full capacity. Thank you. Okay, and the last question is for Dave. Uh, can you confirm the position around the debtor levels in Egypt? Uh, what are the latest debtor days? Yeah, for, uh, thanks for the question. Um, we're, you know, we're delighted to say that debtor levels are, are not an issue for us in Egypt. We're absolutely current, uh, fully paid up to date for all invoices, uh, as we sort of have been since we uh, taken control of the assets. Um, I think that's consistent with the what we've seen since the IMF have come into Egypt and prioritised uh, ensuring that the IOCs are, are paid up to date. I think importantly, we've retained the Rock Upper Country Manager, who has uh, good relationships with the EGPC and is doing a very good job for us in ensuring that we're continuing to be paid up to date for our invoices so no concerns around better levels in Egypt. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Oh, I, think, I think that's all the questions covered. Um, so just, to, just, just to thank you all for your support and for attending the call today. Uh, I hope you found it informative and helpful. We've addressed as many questions as we could throughout the course of the presentation and at the back end of the Q&A piece. And uh, hopefully we get to see you all soon in a proper one-to-one -one, uh, presentation and uh, hopefully a few drinks afterwards. But look, thank you for your time today and take care. Thank you for joining today's call. You may now disconnect your lines. Host